So let's get started. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me know if, uh, if I'm not clear. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So uh, what I would like to do today, divide the talk in broadly two parts. In the first part, I thought since it's a brain awareness week, I will give a general introduction how this C. elegans worm model is used in neuroscience research uh, over the years and, and a little bit about historical perspective. And, and that is sort of will act as a primer for the, uh, the part, second part where I will talk about uh, our uh, lab's work and results. And uh, since it's uh, again the Brain Awareness Week and a lot of wide range of audience here. So what I've decided to uh, uh, you know, focus on the bigger picture uh, rather than details, but always we can discuss both details at, at the end of the talk. Um, I hope uh, it will be clear to uh, all of you. So, uh, so as I don't need to tell this audience that, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the challenging question uh, is that how human brain and behavior works and uh, human being have wondered uh, over the last hundreds of years. And on the left panel, you see a, a very old illustration by a philosopher Descartes that uh, there is always a bidirectional information flow between the environment and the brain. Uh, that makes, uh, helps uh, to take our action. And uh, on the right side, you see more uh, recent view of the brain where uh, different parts of the brains are color coded because a lot of information available now uh, and the anatomical work people have done. And uh, you know, from, from the colleagues uh, of NBRC, my colleagues in NBRC work in human brain, uh, they monitor the activity of the brain using EEG and MRI. And we know the human brain generates a lot of waves and that, are, that is very important for certain uh, functions. And uh, not only from the philosophical point of view, it's also important to understand brain because we know that uh, uh, there are a lot of diseases related to brain, ne neurological diseases, and there we need to treat them. Uh, lack of our understanding how brain works, how behavior works, uh, you know, uh, allow us not to be able to uh, treat it properly. Uh, for example, my mom, who's old now, has undergo a demyelination because of sodium level imbalance, and she lost her uh, consciousness partially. Because she is old, there is a very little hope that the, there is a remyelination will take place again, and that mom can again regain back the function. This is one of the examples. So, uh, so then, how we understand this big question? To understand this big question of how in brain works, then one needs to divide this problem into various parts, like uh, how the brain looks like, how it is composed of, and how it develops, how it works. So people have been working on this problem for ages. I'm sure you are hearing the exciting work from various speakers. So one of the earliest time, earliest time, one of the important lead was made by uh, uh, Cajal, a Spanish neuroscientist. I'm sure many of you uh, know about his work. So what he looked at uh, was uh, the sections of brain cells using light microscopy. And uh, what he told us that the brain is ensemble of cells and the single unit is called neuron. And, and the single unit is very important, which is, which is a polarized cell, which is very important for functioning of the brain. So uh, he made uh, among this, you know, the beautiful anatomical work he did, he made, he made very, uh, some of the very important conceptual uh, theory, which is very important. One of them was the principle of dynamic polarization. So what he said that among the single unit of this brain is neuron and the direct, the information flow within this single, single unit in a unidirectional manner. So which stayed, uh, you know, always true for, you know, we know a lot of, uh, we know about this from various people's work that the neuron uh, received the information through tiny structure called brain rights. And it processed this information and sends this information through electrical signal to the end of the cells. 
where it is connected to the next neuron. The structure is called synapse, where the electrical signal is released as chemical signal. And uh, this was uh, sphere aided by the work from Hodgkin and Huxley. We know that they, uh, they did remarkable work using squid axon, and they told that neurons are excitable cells. They can conduct electricity because of this voltage gated channels and the, the information flows like an electrical signal. And this was remarkable. So, uh, so one of the important breakthrough they made is using model organism like squid. So one important lesson here is that uh, uh, to understand the big question, sometimes we have to go back to the nature and ask simple model organism, organism how it works. For example, squid had uh, a very large diameter axon. If they were able to figure out this problem. So, uh, but, uh, uh, if you see the, the, the from the in the context we are discussing that big question of how behavior is generated, the 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 single neuron works like a you know uh, cell where it can fire uh, action potential, but that does not help understanding the behavior completely because the information that uh, you know visual system process and the information that motor system process is quite different. Here are two examples that on the left, there you see the circuitry of the, uh, uh, you know, how visual system works. So always the visual in information has to go to the visual cortex, not the auditory cortex. So, uh, a similar manner on the right side, you see the knee jerk reflex experiment. We know the, how the reflex work because the, uh, uh, the receptor neurons take the you know, signal to the central nervous system and interneuron process and the motor neuron takes back the reflex mus muscle. That's why knee jerk work. So we understand this simple behavior because we understand the circuitry. The Kahal made the second important uh, uh, conceptual theory that is the connection has to be very specific. So uh, the how the behavior works, if we have to understand, we have to understand how these neurons are connected with each other. That's why uh, the whole world is contributing to this human connectome project where we are trying to decipher the how the neurons, billions of neurons are connected with the trillions of connect connections. So the electron microscopy works is being done. So, uh, so one can understand how difficult this problem to just so solve by a single group. So everybody has to contribute. So uh, from that perspective, long time back, uh, Sidney Brenner, who was a famous molecular biologist. Uh, he was known for his important work, how the codon of amino acid works, how mRNA sequence uh, gives rise to protein, right? So uh, he was a reductionist. What he told that, what he thought that it is very important to understand the behavior, but one is to break down the problem in a simple system. So he thought it will be important to identify organism where we can there are simple neural circuit and we can uh, basically make predictions that how circuit uh, gives rise to behavior, simple behavior. He thought uh, nematode soil dwelling worm would be a cool system because it has a lot of advantage, uh, a simple life cycle, short lifespan, easy to grow in the lab. And uh, he took the challenge and he attracted a lot of great people in his lab in Cambridge uh, and uh, uh, they started working on it. So one of the remarkable work was done by uh, John Salston, his postdoc in CDBNS lab. You see, uh, what he did is he wanted to understand how a single cell embryo forms into whole uh, adult animal. This was a very important question um, in the developmental biology at that time that how egg give rise to organisms. What he did, he just sat next to a microscope uh, in differential interfer interference contrast microscope and started look at the division of these cells. And he kept looking at, and uh, he just figured out how uh, various tissues from, from single embryo, from zygote. Uh, it was remarkable at that time. And it, it also, he also told that C. elegans have 302 neurons, which was very important for Sidney Brenner at that time because he wanted to know how many neurons. So uh, 302 neurons. So then next breakthrough is made by John White, who was a graduate student with computer science background. So uh, what he did was almost 10 years work he did. So what he did 
was he looked at the thin sections by electron microscopy. He wanted to look at the connections, exactly that what we are trying to do for human these days. So he looked at the connections and figured out that 302 neurons are connected by 7,000 chemical synapses and 600 electrical synapses. That are cool and, and about 200 neurons are in the head region, which you call so-called brain or nerve ring of worm. And uh, there was a remarkable similarity. The way the synapse of C. elegans looks like is almost like human. The same kind of electron dense periactive zone and, uh, and you know, pre-filled uh, uh, synaptic vesicles uh, at, the, at the synapse region. So uh, what it provided, this wiring diagram, where we know these connections, we can ask how the behavior works. And uh, for example, here, Martin Chalfi asked that how a simple be behavior like a, a touch sensation. On the right side, what you see is a video where Martin Chalfi uh, is lab. They do what they do is they uh, uh, take eyelash, sorry about this, the video is not, uh, and, and touch the worm, the worm shows a reversible uh, response. And th that response is given due to the circuitry, he could figure out. And also uh, importantly, the circuitry, the way it works, he figured out because of uh, uh, the, the cells where uh, uh, also the C. elegans is transparent, the cells could be ablated using lasers. So he systematically ablated these cells and figured out there are six neurons responsible for gentle touch sensation. Not only that, there are other adv advantage of doing forward genetics to look for mutants that will not show touch sensation behavior. Therefore, one can, uh, he could figure out what are the mechanoreceptor, what are the other components uh, responsible for touch sensation. This was followed by another remarkable discovery where uh, uh, people have identified green fluorescence protein from jellyfish. That discovery happened in uh, Marine Biology Lab, Woodrow, Massachusetts. And uh, Martin was very quick to take this uh, opportunity to clone the GFP and put it in the worm neurons. So actually, the worm neurons were first uh, where uh, uh, you know the GFP was expressed, and that changed the way we look at circuitry. One can look at the neural circuit in the live animal. Here again, you see this touch neurons. Uh, he uh, uh, loves to work on is labeled with green fluorescence protein. So we can look at things in enormous detail. So, so you know that you know, GFP has revolutionized, people have made uh, you know, uh, a GFP a version which is sensitive to calcium. People look at the activity of the neurons in in vivo in, in the brain cells using two photon microscopes. Anyway, so, uh, so one can imagine the C. elegans is a system, although C. elegans brain is way simpler than human brain. There is a no comparison. A lot of things are not their C. elegans. What is remarkable is C. elegans, we have 25,000 genes and C. elegans has 20,000 genes and most of the genes are conserved. And uh, as I said, the connections, the synapse are remarkably similar between human and uh, C. elegans. One can ask how this circuitry uh, develops and how this circuitry forms. And, and I don't need to see that there are a lot of interesting discoveries made using uh, in, in nervous system using the C. elegans model. And now uh, there are interesting questions people are asking because people know various circuitry. The inter interesting question they are asking is, you know, how this circuitry can be modulated by internal state, uh, hunger, and, and other conditions, circadian rhythm, how neuro neuromodulation works using uh, in a whole new area, neuropeptide. So uh, with this uh, you know, background, I just also want to tell that uh, while when you ask a good question in Sidney Brenner's lab, there are a lot of other interesting discovery happens. Uh, he wanted to use C. elegans model for uh, understanding how behavior works, but as a byproduct, a lot of other great thing happens because we know about program cell death because of the work by Bob Horwich. We know how RNAi works because of the work of Andrew Fire and Craig Milo. We know the whole new world of microRNA because of the work of Victor Ambrose and Gary Rafi. Just uh, uh, this is uh, a brief introduction telling that what C. elegans uh, model has offered uh, to the you know, discoveries in biology. With this, I would like to move 
the second part of my talk where I want to talk about uh, uh, our group's work. Uh, hopefully it will make more sense now that I have given this background. As I told that, you know, the, this circuitry is very important for behavior and uh, uh, the circuitry works by, as information flows and, uh, and informations are exchanged at the synapse. Now one can imagine if something wrong, go, something goes wrong, like uh, you have an accident, you broke your spinal cord, the neurons, these axons will be broken. And in case of Rick Hansen, uh, uh, whose neurons in the spinal cord has broken, and uh, rest of his life, he has to use wheelchair. And, uh, and this is one extreme example because the central nervous system neuron does not regenerate. On the other hand, uh, you see the peripheral nerves, one example I will give that the peripheral nerves are also uh, gets injured. On the right side, what you see one example is brachial uh, uh, plexus injuries and other is a carpal tunnel injuries. You see median nerves get injured and broken. Many times these broken nerves and can again regenerate, although they are, don't regenerate perfectly, but they have the regeneration potential. The point is the peripheral nerves have the regeneration potential. However, central uh, nervous system does not regenerate. But people have done experiment. People have people are trying to understand why central nervous system does not neuron does not regenerate. How to make them regenerate so that uh, the uh, the people with injuries can get some relief. So uh, so what has been seen that a lot of theories are there. One can manipulate the intrinsic pathway. In this case, a work from Jaigang his lab in the Harvard. So he manipulated the component of the uh, mTOR pathway, p chain, knocked down. And uh, despite there are a lot of inhibitory environment in the cent central nervous system, now the CNS neuron can regenerate because in the p chain knockdown, the protein translation is upregulated. So this underscores the importance that we understand the, how regeneration works using a system like peripheral nerves. People are using peripheral nerves because it regenerates so that we can understand about the biology of regeneration. So when I was postdoc, uh, I had a background in uh, a, a genetics. I decided that we should again go back to nature, use a simple model organism so that we understood, understand how genes and various molecular pathways control uh, axon regeneration. So what you see here, that since C. elegans is transparent, I told that green fluorescence protein can be expressed and the neurons can be visualized in the adulthood uh, uh, and we can use laser in this case is that we use a laser which breaks this neuron and uh, this is one of the neuron i just talked about martin Chalfi's favorite neuron which is responsible for gentle touch and uh, it is like a peripheral nerve uh, 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 sitting on the skin of the worm and what what i saw was a remarkable thing that this uh, like peripheral nerves in human, these axons again start making a uh, uh, growth cone and try to regrow again in the direction where its original synapse is. So it was cool because now uh, the C. elegans model can be used for uh, understanding how axon regeneration works. So, uh, so that is what uh, we have done uh, for some time uh, in my postdoctoral lab and in my lab. And, uh, and the way it is done is uh, uh, for, since there are a wide range of audience, some of the students might be wondering how it is done. What we did is we used the lasers, a simple laser produced pulse. One can keep on increasing the pulse uh, using a femtosecond laser of uh, uh, two photon microscope, infrared laser. You can have, you know, high frequency, uh, you, know, you know, falling in a very small focused area so that, acts like a sharp knife and you get a very precise uh, injury instead of, uh, you know, laser with low frequency can make a huge uh, a damage, whereas two photon lasers will make a very precise damage. So what it allowed us a handle to look, ask for how axon regeneration works. So same question, what are the genes affecting axon regeneration? So one of the important uh, discovery happened uh, when I was postdoc. It is not only what myself did as a postdoc, but there were a few other labs also contributed to this work. What we found was that 
this neurons form growth cone after axon injury and uh, there is a pathway we call dual leucine zipper kinase dlk1 pathway so if we take away any of this cascade it is like a map kinase kinase regulating another map kinase ultimately transcription factor so uh, if we knock out any of these genes uh, uh, the th these axons will not initiate a, 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 again the regeneration process it will not almost like spinal cord uh, a neuron the remarkable thing is this this pathway was not required for uh, axon regeneration uh, uh, sorry this pathway is not required for development of the neuron uh, it is solely dedicated for axon regeneration that is something we dreamt about and there is a pathway and uh, you might be wondering whether uh, this is very specific to c elegans no it is later on people have figured out uh, in, in mouse uh, uh, also in sciatic nerve injury model that this pathway is very uh, critical for axon regeneration in Drosophila and other models. So, uh, so this pathway is very, very much important to initiate the regeneration process. Then when I set up the lab, then, but this, uh, I wondered whether this regeneration have any meaning, whether the regrowing axon uh, gives rise to function, whether, uh, what is limiting in functional restoration, because regeneration would be meaningful if we can regain function, right? So uh, just by being able to send the growth cone is not enough. It has to reach the target and make the synapse, uh, synapse and connection, right? So we, um, what we saw uh, earlier was there are two types of regeneration uh, uh, in this neuron. We call PLM neuron uh, uh, responsible for posterior uh, touch sensation. So, uh, one type, this axon regrows with a growth cone and, and the distal part uh, start degenerating, right? And it is like uh, a peripheral nerves in human, uh, you know, the distal part degenerates called Valerian degeneration and the proximal parts regrows and try to reach the target area. But we saw another very interesting phenomenon. Half of the fraction, what we saw was this proximal parts regrows and able to salvage this distal degenerating part, it somehow catches up and, and fuse the membrane and we call fusion. And this is not very unusual. It, it was seen in many other invertebrate models earlier that this kind of thing happens. We also looked at electron microscopy section and, and saw that really the, the, at the part of the same mem membrane at the, where it jo joins. <clears throat> so this was cool. <clears throat> People predicted that in other uh, species that this kind of mechanism, fusion, self-fusion mechanism would be very useful. Uh, it can repair because the distal end would not degenerate and the synapse uh, will be restored and, and, and the function will be regained. So we could test it here. And uh, because uh, this neuron is related to some function, we know that sensation. And uh, so a few other things we did was people asked us, uh, our reviewer asked us whether this is a fusion or it's just touching. And what we did here in collaboration of Sandhya Koshika's lab, we looked at the synaptic protein, which travels along the axons. So here is an example where the fusion happened. We photo bleaches that area so that the things are more clearer. And what you see, these punctas are moving. These are actually the synaptic protein RAP3, which is moving bidirectionally. And uh, look at the point of fusion. What you see is that if it is a real fusion, then the, the proteins or synaptic vesicle will tr be transported to the point of fusion. That's what it happens. So it was a direct proof other than the electron microscope that you know, axonal transport is restored in the fusion. So it's a real fusion. It's not an artifact. Right. So now the question is coming back to the question whether it is really functional or not. So the... The way we uh, designed the experiment is uh, the student, my student Atri, she is the first graduate student. She uh, does this axotomy, laser axotomy in the PLM neuron, then uh, do touch assays at various point of time to look at how initially it drops and how it regains. And the interesting thing is that same animal, after doing the behavioral assay, she could image uh, in great detail and look at whether it is a uh, axon a regrowth event is a fusion type or non-fusion type. And, and the interesting thing about this neuron is this 
single neuron in one side correspond to touch sensation behavior of that side. So we have a correlation of behavior and the neuronal regeneration at the single neuron level. So that is very useful for figuring out correlating the function. So again, to give the anatomical feature of this neuron, it, it is growing a longitudinality uh, during development and uh, it is just beneath the skin and it makes a synapse uh, at the ventral side where I was talking about. It is makes a post synaptic connection with the AVA neuron that is very important for the function. It also have a gap junction, right? We cut these neurons at various time points, then we do behavior assay and we can uh, and see what kind of regeneration happened and doing by doing confocal microscopy. So what we asked whether the, whether there is a difference between the uh, functional recovery in the fusion event and non-fusion event. So next slide, uh, again, just to uh, tell you the behavioral assay that you see the students use the eyelash uh, when the worms is moving forward direction, when she touches, it moves reverse back and vice versa. So it's, it's a very quantitative assay developed by Martin Shalfi who worked on touch sensation. We could use this assay and correlate the functional recovery uh, after regeneration. What you see that uh, to our expectation, the fusion events are way different than uh, non-fusion events. So they are really corresponds to functional recovery. This was kind of resolved using this assay. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, the other question was how fusion occurs and um, what are the mechanisms? Uh, our lab and Brent Newman's lab in, in uh, Queensland uh, University both worked on this problem. So uh, I, I just want to summarize that uh, the, how the, you know, this fusion mechanism is working in these neurons. So uh, first neuron is initiating the regrowth and there is a self-recognition machinery where it tells that, you know, this is, I am the proximal part and, and this is my distal counterpart. And what Brent Newman's lab uh, discovered is there is a recognition machinery with uh, the protein like SET7 and PSR, it's like a phosphatidyl serine exposure pathway, which is very important for this recognition process. So what I found when I was postdoc, then we continued in our lab that there's a protein called EFF1, which actually has the fusogenic activity. Actually, it can exchange the membrane, actually fuse this proximal and distal part. So it is uh, interesting. There is a protein which can do this job, which is sufficient for fusion. Originally, this protein was discovered by a person called Benjamin Pavlovich, uh, who is in Tekinon University in Israel, who works on cell development. The, the, the fusion was not known in nervous system. There is no uh, uh, you know, evidence of fusion and then the molecular machinery in the nervous system. Now, and there are more and more evidences coming. It's actually working. Then we asked is that, well, we have a genetic control, uh, molecular control of this fusion process. Now, if we use this mutant, the functional recovery would not happen like wild type. In wild, wild type, what you see that after regeneration at 24 hours, there is an increase in function uh, which does not happen in any of this mutant. So here is a, genetical, a genetic way of proving that the fusion is important for function. That's, that's interesting. Then, uh, then to ask the bigger question that uh, how it is relevant for a uh, human being uh, that this kind of self repair process happen in human. Uh, so when I talk to uh, you know neurosurgeon uh, uh, and doctors, they are very, they get very uh, annoyed uh, because they say that we never saw it because uh, in human, there is no report so far in, in axon injury system that this fusion happens. But uh, what happens is like human does, human cell does show fusion because uh, uh, when our muscle cell forms, myoblast uh, fuse, and there is a fusogen for that. Uh, you know, always there are, there are the gametes, sperm and egg fuse. And there are a lot of interesting uh, fusion events for morphogenesis of our retinal cells. So it's not true that fuso, uh, fusion uh, machinery is not there in the uh, human. It's just that in a neuron, it, a human neuron, it does not happen or there is uh, no report so far. Uh, uh, so, so the way we uh, say that it's always there is a possibility if we 
uh, understand uh, this process using worm, we can uh, use that in future. Imagine that uh, in a spinal cord injury happens, the neurons get degenerated. If there is a glue like uh, this kind of protein, which can fuse it right away after the injury, one, one maybe think, uh, turn this problem in different way. So uh, uh, this is a wishful thinking. We are working uh, with Benjamin Pavlich in Tekinan University, uh, where an invertebrate system we can recapitulate by using this machinery. So always there are encouraging thing, thing we see from the nature. For example, uh, uh, you know, the genomic editing does not happen in even in worm or human in any other organism. Genomic, genomic editing only can, uh, bacteria can do, you know, but people use bacteria carefully, understand how genomic editing works, then now can reproduce and do genomic editing in any organism. So, organism. so therefore, uh, so understanding this process, we believe uh, uh, using simple models, we, we, we are going to, going to create information ways so that we can use it in the higher model system. So I would like to switch gear uh, from here. Then uh, we asked further that uh, how regeneration is affected in old animal. As I said, my old mom's neuron uh, uh, does not regenerate because we uh, adulthood the nervous system regeneration does not happen well. Uh, so we wanted to under correlate this regeneration phenomena in worm with age. So, so far I was telling you the experiment done in very early uh, adulthood stage, but if we do this experiment in older, by day three, we see a significant drop in the functional recovery. So there is a nice correlate that, you know, with age, the regeneration of the peripheral nerves uh, of worm also would decay, right? So now, uh, so this is the clock which is there in every organism right? with age things change and the regeneration also declines now in our lab we have taken various approach and uh, we are using various mutants to ask can we turn this clock can we slow down this clock and uh, of course our approach is using various mutants and one of the mutants we found is uh, a let 7 you see that if we use a let seven mutant, it does not care. Despite their old age, they can restore the function even better than the early stage wild type. Uh, so there are various mutants in the lab we are looking at and whether we can promote uh, uh, regeneration in the worm system. So what is let seven? So let seven is a microRNA. Again, I was telling work from uh, Victor Ambrose and Gary Dufkin isolated this let 7 uh, mechanism. So what let 7 does is it controls um, downstream target like uh, LIN41, which again uh, inhibits uh, its downstream target LIN29. This mechanism is very important uh, for, this let 7 is very important for the developmental transition. Means uh, let 7 is important for worm for that conversion of larval stage into the adult stage. Uh, if let 7 is not there, it will remain like a larva. Uh, therefore, the, the neurons we believe will also re remain like young neuron. And actually, let 7 level is low in the early stage of development, and it goes up in the adulthood, and definitely it has various role, and, and let 7 is a very conserved microRNA in human. People have been seeing it various contests like stem cells and, and muscle uh, cells, uh, retinal cells. So it's very conserved microRNA. So uh, <clears throat> let seven is high in adult, but if let seven is not there, the worm will start, remain like a larva. So if you now uh, imagine the neurons are also younger and this, because the upregulation of this downstream target and that upregulates this machineries, which is promoting regeneration. And uh, that's what it happens in this case. And what we saw is that uh, uh, let seven uh, actually one of the targets of let seven is set seven. I was telling one of the self recognition mechanism that I was telling that proximal end and distal end has to recognize each other for fusion to happen. If the let seven is not there, the set seven is upregulated. That's why the fusion uh, uh, level is gone high, and uh, therefore 
one of the targets of let 7 is uh, fusion machinery. And also you see the let 7 mutant also regenerates uh, uh, functional regeneration is better for the non-fusion events also. So which, which we published a couple of years back. So the next question we asked is that uh, the functional rewiring we are talking about other type where uh, more conventional type where we, are, we have seen in, uh, in the vertebrate uh, peripheral nerves, the axon uh, regrows and the distal end degenerates, whether this uh, regrowing end will ever see uh, and make another synapse and, and it will help functional restoration. This is relevant because uh, in case of vertebrate system, uh, uh, for example, retinal ganglion cells after injury, they have to make a long uh, travel, long distance, these axons and all the way to the brain. So this is a long distance axon regeneration. Uh, uh, therefore, this asking this question where the through the growth cone, whether it will make again synapse is relevant for studying the other type of regeneration. We asked whether the regeneration will uh, give rise to function in later stage. So what we saw indeed that although in 24 hour, this type of non-fusion event does not support regeneration, but if you look at the later time points, uh, 48 hour for say, for example, we see there is now a significant improvement. So that means uh, long range after long range regrowth also at some point of time, they are able to support functional restoration. Again, uh, we could uh, correlate these uh, various events uh, by looking at the uh, anatomical feature of the regrowth here. You are looking at the GFP level neurons, it's regrowing. And also at the same time, we look at the synaptic protein RAP3 where we can uh, look at the synapse. I told you that originally the neuron makes a synapse at the ventral nerve cord. We see the particular uh, phenomena where uh, some of the regeneration events where uh, about 40% of them, they get targeted to the ventral side uh, and again, enrich synaptic machinery like RAP3. These are the events which are more uh, correlated with the function. Other type of events, if they're growing straight, making multi-branch looping, uh, they are not supporting function. It makes sense because the uh, I told you the original synapse was at the ventral side where the postsynaptic cells are there. So during regeneration, if they uh, manage to reach there and make a synapse-like structure, that will give rise to function. So now we have a way to look at the uh, uh, you know functional rewiring, rewiring in the non-fusion events as well. Then the question is uh, uh, how, how this process is controlled. And also we see this, uh, you know, this ventral targeting events are also declined with age. So the age is a factor for this accuracy of, of this guidance gets affected due to age. And uh, by again, looking at, looking at the collection of the genetic resources and pathways, what we found is that this aging related effect in this, uh, you know, the ventral guidance can be also, uh, uh, you know, uh, inhibited or, or overcome using a set of mutant that uh, changes the insulin signal. So if we take out the, take a mutant which removes the insulin receptor or downstream kinases, what we see is that the regenerative functional restoration or ventral targeting events are higher in the older age. Uh, so that means this pathway is somehow inhibited. So, uh, and that is dependent on this transcription factor, which we know that uh, uh, this kinases ultimately down regulates the DAP16 uh, entry into the nucleus. Therefore, uh, the upregulated regeneration is dependent on uh, uh, DAP16. And what does it mean? Just give a little bit of background. Uh, the insulin signaling uh, is, these mutants are, almost like restricting the calorie. So what people have uh, figured out, uh, actually origina originally work done by Cynthia Kenyon and then others, now it is true for uh, mouse and fly, they, these mutants live for longer. So uh, this insulin receptor mutants lives almost twice or more than twice uh, the wild type worm. Uh, uh, and because this, and pe people figured out this, pathway works in the intestine of the worm. And uh, the intestines are the center where the aging is triggered. And this mutant somehow 
uh, is not utilizing the uh, uh, sugar properly and uh, therefore they are restricted in calorie uh, utilization and they uh, they live longer then uh, we asked then what the phenomena of enhanced regeneration we are seeing is it because of the general aging of the worm uh, that is uh, uh, you know related to the function of this signaling in the intestine so what we can do in the worm is we can put the gene back in various tissues uh, so what we saw is that if we put them back in the intestine, we cannot rescue that. Unlike if we put using, use its own promoter, we can rescue, but if we use the promoter for intestine, we cannot rescue, right? And uh, if we use the neuronal promoter, we can rescue. If, if we can use muscle promoter also, you can rescue, but not intestine. So it is not the aging center that is regulating the regeneration, we think. It is the the function of this signaling, same signaling, but the functioning in neuron and partly in muscle for promoting regeneration, which is interesting. It's uh, the same pathway which is utilized for organism le level aging is controlling the age of this neuron, uh, intrinsic age of this neuron. So what is then uh, this insulin signaling controlling that it controls the targeting and functional restoration? A lot of works had been done again uh, on insulin signaling. We know the target of this uh, transcription factor, FOX or DAF16. And uh, we just uh, checked, did go analysis with our terms. And we figured that two very important components are very relevant for this process. We found that DAF16 uh, uh, transcriptional targets are two protein. One is called UNC40, other is called Netrin. Just to give a little bit background, the netrine is a guidance cue, a chemo, chemo attractant guidance cue used during the development of the spinal cord neurons in human and various kind of, that netrine guides the axons at the ventral. In the netrine mutant, this branch will be missing. Similarly, various organisms, netrine is a conserved uh, guidance cues for ventral guidance. And its bona fide receptor is UNC40 DCC. So if, we see that if UNC40 and DCC is not there, the ventral targeting is reduced and functional restoration is reduced. And UNC40 and UNC6, we find that the target for this uh, DAF16 transcription factor, that is satisfying. And natrine is secreted from the muscle and the uh, UNC40 uh, receptor is in the neuron. Uh, the, my student looked at the sequence since it targets actually uh, the promoter of the UNC40 has a binding site for the DAP16 transcription factor. And uh, what happens, uh, what she saw is that after uh, doing the axonal injury, there is upregulation of this uh, uh, UNC40 receptor in the neuron, in the injured neurons. Uh, if you look at on the right side, the quantification it upregulates. Uh, whereas in the DAP16 mutant, this upregulation is absent. So uh, what we think that being a transcription factor for UNC40 after axotomy, somehow uh, the DAP16 is helping the upregulation of UNC40 so that the UNC40 is present in the in right amount so that it can help the navigation. Similarly, uh, uh, we have also found that uh, the netrin, which is secreted from the muscle, is also controlled by this signaling. Just to uh, cut the long story, st uh, story short, uh, what uh, we have summarized here is in this part of this work that there is an original synapse of this neuron at the ventral side. When we break that, and there is a problem in the function, but uh, what happens in the, in the wild type situation, this netrin receptor UNC40 is upregulated, and they will be attracted towards the ventral side because the ventral muscle secrete the UNC6. And the both UNC6 in the muscle and the UNC40 in the neuron is controlled by a DAP16 transcription factor. In the absence of the DAP16 transcription factor, uh, neither UNC40 in the neuron nor UNC6 in the muscle can be regulated. Therefore, the, the axons will not be sufficiently attracted toward the ventral side where the original synapse forms. Therefore, uh, the ventral targeting will be problematic in this mutant. 
and this work is under revision. So I have talked a pathway where, where the insulin signaling is used. Just to uh, <clears throat> summarize, we have what we have learned so far. So I have I have talked about a system where we can uh, injure this neuron, uh, neuron using laser, and uh, there is an important component uh, we found out initially DLK pathway, which is very important for the initiation of the regrowth, which was published earlier. But what today I shared is that there is a remarkable process that the proximal end regrows and can join the distal end, therefore, you know, uh, rescue and repair the whole neuron and the, there's a quick functional recovery. And that is regulated by a protein called EFF1, which has a fusogenic activity. And this process can be also controlled by uh, LET7 microRNA, which is a conserved microRNA. I have also talked about another type of regeneration where when the cell can, the axon cannot fuse, they regrow and try to reach the original target area and makes a synapse-like structure. And that process is controlled by insulin signaling through uh, controlling the guidance machinery. So uh, although uh, some of the things we found, that, for example, EFF1 uh, is a very warm specific protein, but the as I said, the human has fusogen, uh, and maybe sometime in future we'll figure out that how to, uh, you know, control this process so that we can make this process happen in the vertebrate system. Now, all those, always, this question comes: the what is the relevance of our discovery uh, in the context of higher system? So, uh, following our discovery of let seven, uh, here is a discovery from uh, Jaygen's lab in the Harvard. So what they found is they manipulate the LET7 in a similar way uh, uh, to promote the regeneration of the retinal ganglion cell, I was telling, which has to grow longer distance. So since LET7 is conserved, when the LET7 was downregulated, these neurons in the central nervous system, retinal ganglion axon, can now regrow despite their inhibited environment. They are in an inhibited environment. So that is cool that uh, one of the findings we made in NBRC lab now is uh, conserved so that that can be used in invertebrate model. And there is a host of factories which uh, uh, makes drugs or they call it sponge, which uh, can be used to downregulate microRNAs, probably in future can be used uh, to try in human. There is a, another last example I want to give last few minutes of the talk. Uh, <clears throat> You know, the uh, Christopher Reeve, the famous, uh, uh, you know, Hollywood star had the spinal cord injury once during shooting, he fell down from the horse. And uh, as we, uh, as I was telling you that, that our effort to understand regeneration is uh, in, at the basic level so far, that there is no drug that could promote uh, regeneration of broken axon in human. And it's, it's at the basic research level. But what has been seen that very helpful is the rehabilitation ther ther uh, therapy. And there are a lot of uh, rehabilitation paradigm. What you see here, Christopher Reeve is undergoing a water therapy where the, and the doctors and other nurses are trying to help him uh, you know, shake his leg and so that it's like recap the swimming activity. And that's sort of one part of the regimen of this uh, you know, rehabilitation therapy. And uh, it, it, it changed his life and he, he had a, you know, spinal cord injury, very upper part of the spinal cord. So a lot of activities were affected. So, uh, so here is the situation now. I, uh, uh, one of the postdoc in the lab asked that whether we can recap that in the worm. So how one, we can make worm swim. So it, it's very easy. You can put the worm in the, uh, uh, in a buffer. Worm will uh, have no choice, it swims. But uh, not only that, before uh, we did that, people have figured out the swimming uh, type of uh, you know sessions, uh, short duration swimming sessions behaves like a uh, exercise because there is a ATP consumption and and a reduction in lipids, fats, and and that has a lot of other uh, good effects of exercise. Uh, uh, this was established paradigm of exercise in the worm. So what you will see that the postdoc Sandeep found is that. 
So when he make the old worm swing for 90 minutes, again, he can push the clock, like let's say when our insulin signaling, I showed it genetically. The swimming works, and, the, and, and despite they are in the old age, if they undergo 90 minutes swimming, they will promote regeneration. So he further uh, worked on this process. Again, I will not take into the details. What he found is due to the swimming, there is a reduction in the ATP level consumption, biochemically he showed, and uh, that triggers that ratio of ATP and AMP to drop in the ATP level sensed by a, a global energy sensor AMP kinase, uh, which is there in neuron as well as muscle. Uh, so his work shows that uh, the AMP kinase activity is very critical in muscle as well as neuron for uh, seeing the swimming, positive effect of the swimming in regeneration. He also showed that due to swimming, the, the axons can uh, regrow better and, and, and targeted better. So there is a correlation of uh, the single correlation of single worm correlation of the axon regeneration in the behavioral recovery. And he could also uh, uh, recap that there is using a drug called uh, uh, metformin, uh, which is activates the unkindness pathway. So, uh, so that is what is summarized in this article that uh, the swimming induced effect uh, uh, promotes, uh, uh, swimming promotes regeneration using the uh, energy sensor and kinase activity in the muscles and the neuron. Again, I think I would uh, like to end here. Uh, this work is done by um, uh, very talented, one of the talented graduate students, Atri Basu, who is going to join his postdoc very soon, writing thesis. And uh, another graduate, Shibram, uh, sh student Shibram and uh, postdoc Sandeep, Sandeep today what we shared. I would also uh, like to acknowledge uh, various people, uh, the NBRC for uh, their generous support, the India Alliance uh, support and the other grant support and various facilities and especially the uh, CGC who supplies our warm. And, and the beautiful collaborators we have, Sandhya Koshika, Kavita Babu, uh, and, and in-house collaborator, Saurabh, and who, who helped us in the micro project. And, and it is, I just want to say that it's a wonderful community now in uh, India, you know, Kavita Babu, uh, Sandhya Koshika, uh, and various other people, about uh, 20, 25 labs working on the warm and half of them are uh, nervous system. So it's a beautiful community. So um, with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge also the lab and thank you for your attention and thanks for the invitation again.